You will recall that when the planned redundancies became necessary as a result of the discouraging trading figures shown by this small firm, in contrast, so I gather from the company reports with several of your other enterprises, you personally deputed to me the task of speaking to those who are to be asked to leave. It was suggested to me that if they were asked to resign in order to avoid the unpleasantness of being given their cards, it may be unnecessary for the firm to offer any compensation. Having glanced personally through my staff sheets, you underlined the names of four people, the first being that of my clerical assistant, W.S. Singlebury. Your actual words to me were that he seemed fairly old and could probably be frightened into taking a powder. You were speaking to me in your democratic style. From this point on, I feel able to write more freely, it being well understood at office managerial level that you do not read more than the first two sentences of any given report. You believe that anything that cannot be put into two sentences is not worth attending to, a piece of wisdom which you usually attribute to the late Lord Beaverbrook. As I question whether you have ever seen Singlebury, with whom this report is mainly concerned, it may be helpful to describe him. He worked for the company for many more years than myself, and his attendance record was excellent. On Mondays, Wednesdays and Fridays, he wore a blue suit and a green knitted garment with a front zip. On Tuesdays and Thursdays, he wore a pair of grey trousers of man-made material, which he called my flannels, and a fawn cardigan. The cardigan was omitted in summer. He had, however, one distinguishing feature. Very light blue eyes with a defensive expression, as though apologising for something which he felt guilty about but could not put right. The fact is that he was getting old. Getting old is, of course, a crime of which we grow more guilty every day. Singlebury had no wife or dependents and was by no means a communicative man. His room is, or was, a kind of cubbyhole adjoining mine. You have to go through it to get into my room. And it was always kept very neat. About his things, he did show some mild emotion. They had to be arranged in a certain pattern in respect to his in-and-out trays, and Singlebury stayed behind for two or three minutes every evening to do this. He also managed to retain every year the complimentary desk calendar sent to us by Dino's, the Italian cafe on the corner. Singlebury was in fact the only one of my staff who was always quite certain of the date. To this too, his attitude was apologetic. His phrase was, I'm afraid it's Tuesday. His work, as was freely admitted, was his life. But the nature of his duties, though they included the postbook and the addressograph, were rather hard to define, having grown round him with the years. I can only say that after he left, I was surprised myself to discover how much he had had to do. Oddly connected in my mind with the matter of the redundancies is the irritation of the damp in the office this summer, and the peculiar smell. Not the ordinary smell of damp, emphasised by the sudden appearance of representatives of a firm of damp eliminators who had not been sent for by me, nor is there any record of my having done so. These people simply vanished at the end of the day and have not returned. Another firm to whom I applied as a result of frequent complaints by the female staff have answered my letters but have so far failed to call. Singlebury remained unaffected by the smell, joining very much against his usual habit in one of the two frequent discussions of the subject he said that he knew what it was. It was the smell of disappointment. For an awkward moment, I thought he must have found out by some means that he was going to be asked to go. But he went on to explain that in 1942, the whole building had been requisitioned by the Admiralty and that relatives had been allowed to wait or queue there in the hope of getting news of those missing at sea. The repeated disappointment of these women, Singlebury said, must have permeated the building like a corrosive gas. 
All this was very unlike him. I make it a point not to encourage anything morbid. Singlebury was quite insistent and added, as though by way of proof, that the liner in the corridors was Admiralty issue and had not been renewed since 1942 either. I was astonished to realise that he had been working in the building for so many years before the present tenancy. I realised that he must be considerably older than he had given us to understand. This, of course, means that there will be wrong entries on his cards. The actual notification to the redundant staff passed off rather better in a way than I had anticipated. By that time, everyone in the office seemed inexplicably conversant with the details, and several of them, in fact, had gone far beyond their terms of reference. Young Patel, for instance, who openly admits that he will be leaving us as soon as he can get a better job, taking me aside and telling me that to such a man as Singlebury, dismissal would be like death. Dismissal is not the right word, I said. But death is, Patel replied. Singlebury himself, however, took it very quietly. Even when I raised the question of the company's early retirement pension scheme, which I could not pretend was over generous, he said very little. He was generally felt to be in a state of shock. The two girls whom you asked me to speak to were quite unaffected, having already found themselves employment as hostesses at the Adolphinarium near here. Mrs Horrocks, a filing on the other hand, did protest and was so offensive on the question of severance pay that I was obliged to agree to refer it to a higher level. I consider this as one of the hardest day's work that I have ever done for the company. Just before his month's notice, if we were to call it that, was up, Singlebury, to my great surprise, asked me to come home with him one evening for a meal. In all the past years, the idea of his having a home, still less asking anyone back to it, had never arisen, and I did not at all want to go there now. I felt sure, too, that he would want to reopen the matter of compensation, and only a quite unjustified feeling of guilt made me accept. We took an underground together after work travelling in the late rush hour to Clapham North and walked some distance in the rain. His place, when we eventually got to it, seemed particularly inconvenient, the entrance being through a small cleaner's shop. It consisted of one room and a shared toilet on the half landing. The room itself was tidy, arranged so it struck me much along the lines of his cubbyhole, but the window was shut and it was oppressively stuffy. This is where I bury myself, said Singlebury. There were no cooking arrangements and he left me there while he went down to fetch us something ready to eat from the steak arama next to the cleaners. In his absence, I took the opportunity to examine his room, though of course not in an inquisitive or prying manner. I was struck by the fact that none of his small store of stationery had been brought home from the office. He returned with two steaks wrapped in aluminium foil, evidently a special treat in my honour, and afterwards he went out onto the landing and made cocoa, a drink which I had not tasted for more than 30 years. The evening dragged, rather. In the course of conversation, it turned out that Singlebury was fond of reading. There were, in fact, several issues of a colour-printed encyclopaedia which he had been collecting as it came out, but unfortunately it had ceased publication after the seventh part. Reading is my hobby, he said. I pointed out that a hobby was rather something that one did with one's hands or in the open air, a relief from the work of the brain. Oh, I don't accept that distinction, Singlebury said. The mind and the body are the same. Well, one cannot deny the connection, I replied. Fear, for example, releases adrenaline which directly affects the nerves. No, I don't mean connection. I mean identity, Singlebury said. The mind is the blood. Nonsense, I said. You might just as well tell me that the blood is the mind. It stands to reason that the blood can't think. I was right, after all, in thinking that he would refer to the matter of the redundancy. This was not until he was seeing me off at the bus stop when for a moment he turned his grey, exposed-looking face away from me and said that he did not know how he could manage if he really had to go. He stood there like someone who has tried to give satisfaction. He even used this phrase, 
saying that if the expression were not redolent of a bygone age, he would like to feel he had given satisfaction. Fortunately, we had not long to wait for the 45 bus. At the expiry of the month, the staff gave a small tea party for those who were leaving. I cannot describe this occasion as a success. The following Monday, I missed Singlebury as a familiar presence, and also, as mentioned above, because I had never quite realised how much work he had been taking upon himself. As a direct consequence of losing him, I found myself having to stay late, not altogether unwillingly, since although following general instructions I have discouraged overtime, the extra pay in my own case would be instrumental in making ends meet. Meanwhile, Singlebury's desk had not been cleared. That is, of the trays, pencil sharpener and complimentary calendar, which were of course office property. The feeling that he would come back, not like Mrs Horrocks who has run up and called around incessantly, but simply come back to work out of habit and through not knowing what else to do, was very strong, without being openly mentioned. I myself half expected and dreaded it, and I had mentally prepared two or three lines of argument in order to persuade him, if he did come, not to try it again. Nothing happened, however, and on the Thursday, I personally removed the things from his cubbyhole into my own room. Meanwhile, in order to dispel certain quite unfounded rumours, I thought it best to issue a notice for general circulation, pointing out that if Mr Singlebury should turn out to have taken any unwise step, and if in consequence any inquiry should be necessary, we should be the first to hear about it from the police. I dictated this to our only permanent typist, who immediately said, oh, he would never do anything like that. He would never cause any unpleasantness like bringing the police into the place. He'd do all he could to avoid that. I did not encourage any further discussion, but I asked my wife, who is very used to social work, to call round at Singlebury's place in Clapham North and find out how he was. She did not have very much luck. The people in the cleaner's shop knew, or thought they knew, that he was away, but they had not been sufficiently interested to ask where he was going. On Friday, young Patel said he would be leaving as the damp and the smell were affecting his health. The damp is certainly not drying out in this seasonably warm weather. I also, as you know, received an invitation on Friday at very short notice. In fact, no notice at all. I was told to come to your house in Suffolk Park Gardens that evening for drinks. I was not unduly elated, having been asked once before after I had done rather an awkward small job for you. In our company, justice not only has not to be done, but it must be seen not to be done. The food was quite nice. It came from your caterers, grade three. I spent most of the evening talking to Ted Holler, one of the area sales managers. I did not expect to be introduced to your wife, nor was I. Towards the end of the evening, you spoke to me for three minutes in the small room of the green marble floor and matching wallpaper leading to the ground floor toilet. You asked me if everything was all right, to which I replied, all right for whom? You said that nobody's fault was nobody's funeral. I said that I had tried to give satisfaction. Passing on towards the wash basins, you told me with seeming cordiality to be careful and watch it when I had mixed drinks. I would describe my feeling at this point as resentment, and I cannot identify the exact moment when it passed into unease. I do know that I was acutely uneasy as I crossed the hall and saw two of your domestic staff, a man and a woman, holding my coat which I'd left in the lobby and apparently trying to brush it. Your domestic staff all appear to be of foreign extraction, and I personally feel sorry for them, and do not grudge them a smile at the oddly assorted guests. Then I saw they were not smiling at my coat, but that they seemed to be examining their fingers and looking at me earnestly and silently, and the collar or shoulders of my coat was covered with blood. As I came up to them, although they were both still absolutely silent, the illusion or impression passed, 
and I put on my coat and left the house in what I hope was a normal manner. I now come to the present time. The feeling of uneasiness which I have described as making itself felt in your house has not diminished during this past weekend, and partly to take my mind off it, and partly for the reason I have given, I had decided to work overtime again tonight, Monday the 23rd. This was in spite of the fact that the damp smell had become almost a stench, as of something putrid, which must have affected my nerves to some extent, because when I went out to get something to eat at Dino's, I left the lights on, both in my own office and in the entrance hall. I mean that for the first time since I began to work for the company, I left them on deliberately. As I walked to the corner, I looked back and saw the two solitary lights looking somewhat forlorn in contrast to the glitter of the Arab-American Mutual Loan Corporation opposite. After my meal, I felt absolutely reluctant to go back to the building and wished then that I had not given way to the impulse to leave the lights on. But since I had done so, and they must be turned off, I had no choice. As I stood in the empty hallway, I could hear the numerous creakings, settlings and faint tickings of an old building, possibly associated with the plumbing system. The lifts, for reasons of economy, do not operate after 6.30pm, so I began to walk up the stairs. After one flight, I felt a strong, creeping tension in the nerves of the back, such as any of us feel when there is danger from behind. One might say that the body was thinking for itself on these occasions. I did not look round, but simply continued upwards as rapidly as I could. At the third floor I paused and could hear footsteps coming patiently up behind me. This was not a surprise. I had been expecting them all evening. Just at the door of my own office, or rather of the cubbyhole, for I have to pass through that, I turned and saw at the end of the dim corridor what I had also expected. Singlebury advancing towards me with his unmistakable shuffling step. My first reaction was a kind of bewilderment as to why he, who had been such an excellent timekeeper, so regular day by day, should become a creature of the night. He was wearing the blue suit. This I could make out by its familiar outline. But it was not until he came halfway down the corridor towards me and reached the patch of light falling through the window from the street that I saw that he was not himself. I mean, that his head was nodding, or rather swivelling irregularly from side to side. It crossed my mind that Singlebury was drunk. I had never known him drunk, or indeed seen him take anything to drink, even at the office Christmas party. But one cannot estimate the effect that trouble will have upon a man. I began to think what steps I should take in this situation. I turned on the light in his cubbyhole as I went through and waited at the entrance of my own office. As he appeared in the outer doorway, I saw that I had not been correct about the reason for the odd movement of the head. The throat was cut from ear to ear, so that the head was nearly severed from the shoulders. It was this which had given the impression of nodding, or rather lolling. As he walked into his cubbyhole, Singlebury raised both hands and tried to steady the head as though conscious that something was wrong. The eyes were thickly filmed over as one sees in the carcasses of a butcher's shop. I shut and locked my door, and not wishing to give way to nausea or to lose all control of myself, I sat down at my desk. My work was waiting for me as I had left it. It was the file on the matter of the damp elimination. And there not being anything else to do, I tried to look through it. On the other side of the door, I could hear Singlebury sit down also, and then try the drawers of the table, evidently looking for the things without which he could not start work. After the drawers had been tried, one after the other, several times, there was almost total silence. The present situation is that I am locked in my own office and would not, no matter what you offered me, indeed I could not go out through the cubbyhole and pass what is sitting at the desk. The early cleaners will not be here for seven hours and 45 minutes. I have passed the time so far as best I could in writing this report. 
One consideration strikes me. If what I have next door is a visitant, which should not be walking but buried in the earth, then its wound cannot bleed, and there will be no stream of blood moving slowly under the whole width of the communicating door. However, I am sitting at the moment with my back to the door, so that without turning round, I have no means of telling whether it has done so or not.